So there are people who are being victimized by these algorithms who may not even know that an algorithm was making the decision. Um, and that I think is really dangerous and we need to do a better job as a society of making sure that AI is ready for the tasks that we want to assign it, that it's capable of doing those with an error rate that we find acceptable and that is not discriminating. Aloha, I'm Robert Perkinson, coordinator of the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series at UH and a professor of American Studies. Um, and our guest today is Kevin Roos, who is a technology correspondent for The New York Times. Um, he's been on the technology beat for many years now. He's produced a documentary series. He has a podcast. Um, he's written three books, the first of which, amazingly, he wrote as a sophomore in college at Brown. Um, and he has, his current book is what we're gonna be talking about today, Future Proof. And it is both a survey of the rapidly changing landscape in technology and an exploration of the countless ways new technologies are changing our lives from the emotional level to the economic level, um, as well as a primer for what we should be doing about it at the personal level, policy level, and beyond. So um, I'm really happy to have you with us today. It's, thank you for flying here. Thank you for having me. And it's great to have you. So good to be here. Um, the, the tech bookshelf at the bookstores is kind of full these days, um, but I found your book really refreshingly straightforward. I like the way it focused on the present rather than the future and the way that it's really prescriptive, not just descriptive. What brought you to the text, um, to the writing project, and what did you hope to accomplish with it? Well, I've been writing about technology for about a decade now, and uh, four or five years ago when I started thinking about doing this book, AI and sort of machine learning and automation were ev all everyone was talking about in Silicon Valley. These days it's crypto, but back then it was, it was artificial <laughs> intelligence. And I kept talking to these technologists, these executives, these startup founders, these investors who were making really impressive strides toward automating a lot of different kinds of work. There were teams that were working on um, doing, using machine learning to diagnose certain types of diseases. There were teams that were using uh, AI to try to replace lawyers and do certain types of legal work. There were teams, even teams working on replacing journalists and automating some of what we do um, in writing our stories for us. And so I started thinking about this and, and thinking about not only this technology, but what was gonna happen to all the people who are in the jobs now who are going to be automated out of those jobs as a result of this technology? And in particular, what should they do? What can we, as people who are you know, vulnerable to this kind of technological disruption, what can we do to protect ourselves? How do we not get put out of a job by a robot? What are the skills and abilities that could help us um, survive and thrive in the technological future? So uh, that was really where the book started. Yeah, no, that's uh, obviously important and we all want to know that. Uh, as we want to continue to have jobs and figure out how to manage um, the world that we're in. You know, I was struck by, um, I'm a kid of the Terminator movies generation, and it seems to me that ever since Sh um, Shelley's Frankenstein, we've been imagining dystopian technological futures, but you really, um, even though you're looking to the future, you really also urge us to kind of pay attention to what's happening right now. Why do you think it's kind of important for us to shift the focus of the technology discussion from just the future to thinking about what's actually already here. Well, I think there's this amazing phenomenon that happens over and over again through history where we think of something as a, a sort of futuristic invention that we see in sci-fi movies and then you know we, we call that a robot and then it arrives and we don't call it a robot anymore. So like for years it was like these things, robots are going to wash our clothes for us. That's, that was like a big utopian dream in the early 20th century. It was full of, sci-fi novels were full of this. And then the washing machine and the dryer arrived, and all of a sudden they weren't robots anymore. They were just washers and dryers, and everyone had them. And so that's kind of the, the pattern um, that happens with technological progress uh, over the years, is that 
people, you know, new work gets automated, people sort of adjust to it. Um, it, you know, displaces some people um, from their jobs, from their livelihoods, and then we come up with new and, and interesting things for those people to do. So I was very curious about what was happening now in, you know, 20, I guess, 19, when I, when I started writing the book, and, and now in 2022, because our world is full of AI and automation, some of which, which we don't even recognize or know is there. So AI is helping, uh, you know, shape the, the sort of way that we consume media and what is recommended to us, what we pay attention to. Uh, it's shaping who we vote for, what kind of politicians are able to, uh, to run for office and win. It's shaping our preferences, our clothes, our consumer behaviors. Um, it's shaping what news we see on yeah. our social media network. So AI is really operating on all of us in the background all of the time. Um, and so I wanted to just focus on that. There's so much here happening now. I don't want to try to predict uh, what's going to happen 10 years from now because honestly, you know, we journalists and writers in general are not very good at predicting what 10 years is going to look like. Um, let's drill into the automation topic and the possibility of the jobs that we might lose. Um, I guess we, when that conversation began with robots on assembly lines, we tended to think of you know, the manufacturing industry, the manufacturers. Now we're starting to think about cab drivers. Um, but what are some jobs that might be subject to automation that, or maybe are already, in a sense, being automated that people might not think of, either full automation or partial? Yeah, this is a big misconception. Um, and still, it amuses me. Every time there's a story about automation or AI in, in the newspaper or on TV, they illustrate it with like a factory machine. It's like a, one of those you know, machines in a car factory with you know, big robot arms moving around. That's how we think of it's nice automation visual. happening. It's a great visual. Um, like, like this in the background, that's a robot. But that a kind of robotics automation is only a small piece of what's happening. Much more automation is happening in software um, that doesn't have robot arms. So for a long time, uh, technology displaced manual labor. People in car factories, people in steel plants, that was the kind of work that machines were good at doing. But today's advances in AI and machine learning um, and things like deep neural networks have made it possible for computers to do cognitive labor as well. They can think, they can plan, they can strategize, they can recognize patterns, they can make projections. So actually a lot of the most vulnerable jobs to, to being replaced by robots today are white collar jobs in fields like finance, in law, in, um, in consulting, in insurance, in journalism. Um, and those are the kinds of jobs that machines are now able to do with increasing accuracy and increasing sophistication. So how is it working, for example, in law or accounting, in these higher level professions that 20 years ago people thought were insulated. It's more, it's more kind of partial insulation, uh, automation rather than full automation in those fields, or both? Well, it's, it's happening in lots of ways. There are some fields where it's you know, sort of happening around the edges, some, you know, a couple jobs here, a couple jobs there. There are also entire industries that are being totally transformed by automation, um, not in the way that we used to think of, like the robots come into the factory, but in terms of new firms that are, being, uh, that are coming up to do the same work as old firms with many fewer people. So one of the examples I write about in the book is this Chinese company called MyBank. Um, my bank has, it's a, it's a lender. They make loans to people to buy cars and houses. And their signature product is called um, 310 um, because it takes people three minutes to fill out an application. It takes uh, the AI one second to decide whether you're credit worthy or not. And zero humans are involved in the process. Wow. So you can get a loan without talking to a single person. And that sounds kind of cool, but then you remember, oh, there are all these banks that have thousands of right. loan officers whose entire job is to do that calculation. And in the so, age of Kafka, they had whole floors of <laughs> clerks. Exactly. So those firms are now losing market share to my bank. My bank is growing, and so it is going to be able, it already is issuing billions of dollars a year in, in loans, and it is going to replace the firms that had thousands of people doing those jobs. So those jobs aren't being automated exactly, but mm -hmm. they kind of are. Do you see what I mean? Sure, yeah. Um, what I was amused by a book review you wrote recently, or rather you turned part of the book review over to a bot. And that suggested, you know, that you actually tried to get this bot to compose original material. How did that go and how far might that go in the near term? 
Yeah, this was sort of a stunt. In um, terms of I, uh, writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I think I should say, like, no industry is safe. This is happening in every industry, no matter how creative or, uh, or, or protected we think it might be. So I wrote a, an article for the New York Times Book Review. It was, I was assigned to review a book about artificial intelligence. And I thought midway through the book, oh, this isn't very good. I, I wish I didn't have to write this. I'm going to try to get a robot to write it. So I used this program. It's called PseudoWrite. And it operates on a, a, an AI uh, called GPT-3, which is a, a big, um, super-powered AI that runs on one of the five fastest supercomputers in the world. It ingests trillions of data points and examples of, of written text. And it's able to, it's sort of like a super-powered version of the autocomplete on your iPhone. Mm -hmm. Like you put in some text and then you tell it, you know, I want you to finish this text and I want you to make it sound like a book review. And it will finish it. So you give it a genre. Well, you can, or you can just right. let it go. But it's you know depending on how accurate you want to make it. So I just I put I wrote a little intro for this book review, and then I pressed you know autocomplete in the in the pseudo write app, and then it it wrote like a 600 word book review um, that was actually quite good. I didn't need to edit it. Yeah, that is amazing. It's amazing because and it's, it was it was kind of generic. Maybe, yeah, but, but it was but passable. No more, you know. If you saw it in your local newspaper, you wouldn't, wouldn't blink. Think that. So actually, I, there was a the Guardian did something similar um, for a, an op-ed column last year, using also using GPT three. And the op-ed editor, in a little postscript at the at the bottom of the piece, he said, "This op-ed was actually easier to edit than many of the op-eds that my human Out. writers." <laughs> <laughs> with their idiosyncrasies and darling sentences. Exactly. So I think this is happening. And it's the, these AIs are, I mean, this GPT-3 only came out two years ago. So this is a very new technology, and it's improving very, very rapidly. OK, so that's on the high end. And I guess self-driving cars are on the high end, and probably some finance and other things that are using very sophisticated machines to replace sophisticated jobs. What about on the low end? like? grocery store checkouts that work terribly. Why is there so much artificial incompetence instead of artificial intelligence still with us? Yeah, th this is a great question, because I think there is there is a lot of automation in our society that we recognize as like not being very good. Like the grocery store is a perfect example, or like when you call uh, the airline or oh something, and you get the phone tree, and it's like press one, <laughs> press two, press three, and you're just like, you're pressing zero. Because you're like, I want to talk to a human. Because this right. robot is not going to get me what I need. So there's a, a great study that came out a few years ago by two economists, uh, Dorono Samoglu and Pasquale Restrepo. And they talk about this concept of so-so automation, which is like, it's kind of mediocre. It's like almost as good as a human, but not quite. But you can kind of substitute it, and people are kind of OK with it. And this is the grocery store, the, the phone, you know, the automated phone system. There are lots of more examples of this. And they actually write that this kind of automation is the most dangerous kind. Because they believe that you know, previous types of automation, if, if there's a type of AI that comes along that is so amazing, it's so much better than humans, that it just replaces all the humans in an industry, that AI is also going to create tons of other jobs for people. So right, just like as music recording versus live performances. It didn't replace them entirely, but it was a clear advance. Exactly. And so that improves the overall productivity of the economy. It creates more jobs than it destroys. That kind of automation is good. But this mediocre automation, these grocery checkout stores, they don't actually make society that much more productive. All they do is allow the owner of the grocery store to like put a couple fewer people on a shift. And they're frustrating for consumers. So it's not actually saving anyone that much time or money. It's just kind of a little bit easier than, than hiring a person. And are they, uh, these co large companies, are they adopting it because they're testing it and there's the promise of greater savings later? Or they just are willing to annoy customers for a 2% profit increase, I guess? I think some of it is the savings. I think there are some people you know, who probably do like the self-checkout. Um, I also think it's a it's a labor relations issue. I mean, workers demand raises. They um, form unions. Right. They um, they want to take vacation days. Uh, robots don't do that. It could also be consultants selling them to companies. It occurs to me. It could also be yeah. It could be that these companies are being told, oh, this is going to radically improve your productivity and customer satisfaction. And, but you, you'll notice at the grocery store, like there's still a worker there. And they have to go in and they have to key in the override when it makes a mistake and put in your birthday if you want to buy alcohol or something yeah. like that. So it still requires humans, just not as many of them. Um, 
there's a lot of jobs that can be that are being automated, that are being replaced, that are maybe being reimagined, and potentially a great many more. Um, so you know, one vision of the future might have human beings becoming hugely obsolete. On the other hand, you know, I'm a historian, so when you look back, you know that um, when automation came to farming and to manufacturing and textiles, you know, at every juncture, people did were concerned about the law, the de-skilling of human labor, and and yet growth and wages continued to grow. And as you said earlier, um, economies adapted and actually thrived through, through that innovation. But could this time be different? Well, I, I'll just add a sort of asterisk to some of that, which is that yes. Previous waves of technology did r raise our overall living standards, did make people wealthier, did shorten the workday, did, did various things to help us. But it doesn't happen automatically and it doesn't happen quickly in some cases. So after the Industrial Revolution um, in, in the 19th century, it took about 50 years by some estimates for wages to catch up with corporate oh, profits. Oh, right. This is that Engels pause that you yeah Yeah. So, about. So it did make the economy more productive. But that, the gains of that increased productivity went to a few people at the top. Mm -hmm. And workers, most of them didn't actually see a rise in their living standard as a result. Well, so, and we've seen that since the 1970s. Exactly. Worldwide. So we are in a kind of another kind of Engels pause today. Engels pause is what they call that period between the advent of industrialization and the, the catching up of workers' wages. Um, and so we're, we're in another moment like that. So I think the question is not, will technology improve our living standard over the long run? I think the answer to that is pretty clearly yes. The question is how long it's going to take and what happens to the people who fall through the cracks in the meantime. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to zoom in on a couple of other keywords that you bring up because I'm an academic and I like keywords. But there were some other kind of cool and worthy concepts that I think we should unpack. Um, one is, um, you know, discrimination by algorithm. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you mean by that and what's at stake? Yes, this is a huge problem in the AI industry today. We have these um, machine learning models like GPT-3 um, that are trained on data, and that data, in some cases, is biased. Maybe it's a database of you know, mug shots of people who have been accused of crimes and it learns to discriminate based on uh, the, the race or the skin color of the person who's being input into the algorithm. And we see this all the time. There are some, you know, famous examples, um, you know, of, of, you know, Google's uh, photo recognition software, you know, misidentifying uh, black faces as gorillas, um, other horrible things like that, that AIs have just been trained using bad data. They've been uh, trained thoughtlessly. And so as a result, they're projecting out bias into the world. And this is really dangerous when you apply AI to things, for example, like, uh, like facial recognition and law enforcement, where you have police departments who are now using these software programs that uh, recognize people's faces. But they have a much higher error rate for black and Latino um, faces than for than for white faces, and so you're getting people who are being arrested for crimes that they didn't commit, um, just because the facial recognition database, the AI, mistook them for someone else. And it's some of these problems might be easy to fix; others are not so much. Because you know, like in the criminal justice arena, if the data sets themselves are if they're good data sets, but they're products of systemic discrimination, um, say you want to assess risks for bail release from jail and it's based on they assess you know how many prior arrests or police stops have you had absolutely um, you know you can imagine it's not so easy to massage that data or produce outcomes that aren't discriminatory and this is happening all over the public sector we now have government agencies that are using ai and algorithms to for example, calculate who's eligible for public housing, or who's eligible for food assistance, or who's may or may not be, you know, committing fraud on their social security benefits, and there, so there are people who are being victimized by these algorithms who may not even know that an algorithm was making the decision, um, and that I think is really dangerous, and we need to do a better job as a society of making sure that AI is ready for the tasks that we want to assign it, that it's capable of doing those with an error rate that we find acceptable and that is not discriminating. Yeah, we have 
not been testing and evaluating. I mean, they've been testing and evaluating to see if it works, but then they launch. Right. No, um, whereas they don't run, you know, phase three clinical trials, um, but maybe they should for some of these apps. Right, exactly. What would have, Instagram would have never been approved if they were in FDA, <laughs> I, ass I assume. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's difficult to overstate how much impact these new technologies are having, you know, as you said, on the choices we make, on our personal relationships, on our sense of self. Um, you're no Luddite, but when did you start to regard your own relationship to technology suspiciously in your own personal life? Yeah, I, I actually remember the exact day. Um, it was a few years ago, and I, um, I had subscribed to one of those like wardrobe in a box services. You know, they like, um, you, you put in your measurements and you tell it like, I like that kind of clothes or I, you know, I like that outfit. And then their algorithms sort of like assess who you are and what your style is and like send you a box of clothes to wear. Um, so I, I was trying one of these out and I got a couple boxes and I wore some of the clothes. And then one day I was wearing this, I still remember it was this bomber jacket that this algorithm had sent me. And I was, it was not the first time I had worn it, but I was standing in front of my mirror and I thought, I hate this. I don't even like this. Why am I wearing this? I'm literally just wearing this because an algorithm told me that I would like it. And that was sort of a light bulb moment for me because then I go, wait a minute, are all of my preferences derived from the decisions of algorithms? Am I actually making any of my own choices about the music I like, the TV shows I watch, the food I eat, the vacations I go on, or is it all just being fed to me through these AI-driven algorithms? And so then I really got suspicious, and that's when I started looking right. into that. Um, when I am going through the newsfeed in the New York Times, am I observing the choices of real editors, or are they changing the sort order based on reader demand and other algorithmic both factors. Both. both, yeah. So, so we have lots of human editors, and every day they have a, a meeting at the New York Times, and they pick, you know, these these are the stories that are going on the home page. Um, that's a human decision. Um, and then there's also like, you know, certain types of personalization, so that if the app, you know, knows that you really like stories about sports, it might put those in a different place than it I would see. for for someone else. Um, but the top stories of the day are are always selected by humans. Okay, so besides um, going back to choosing your own clothes, um, what have you done, you know, just in your own personal life to try to, because I think we all struggle. I mean, we know that our kids struggle a lot to turn off their phones yeah. or to not be on them, or we struggle with them, but, you know, we do, we do too. So what are, what, what are some of the battles that you have waged and either won or <laughs> lost? Well, I've lost some, as you mentioned, but I, I've won a couple. And one of the ones that I, I won, or at least I, I feel like I, I got a, a victory on, I, uh, I went through a 30-day phone detox program, um, which was, you know, exactly like it sounds. I had a coach, a phone coach, this woman named Catherine Price, who's a professional phone detox specialist. Could you get a buterol or anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she, so I realized I had a lot of my sort of fears about my own sort of uh, adoption of algorithmic preferences came from the fact that I was always on my phone. And I was letting my phone tell me what to pay attention to, what to buy, where to go. I was, I was so dependent. My phone had used to be my assistant. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it got promoted to be my boss. And so part of what I was trying to do with, with Catherine, with my phone coach, is to demote it, to make it my assistant again, to make it so that it was helping me rather than controlling me. So there, Catherine has a 30-day program I went through. It involves, you know, setting timers and putting your phone in a locked safe and oh my God, she putting a rubber famous. band. She must be famous now. Oh, she's, she's, you know, <laughs> she's done quite well. Her book is amazing. Um, and it really did change my life because it, it didn't stop me from using my phone. It's not an abstinence-based program because uh -huh. um, I don't think it's realistic. You know, we all need yeah. phones these days. But it is about transforming the relationship and understanding, okay, why do I reach for my phone? When do I reach mm -hmm. for my phone? What am I hoping to gain from it? Um, and so I was able to do things like get back into reading books and you know, start taking walks outside without staring down on my phone. It really did transform my life and my relationships. Do you still use the rubber band? And I, I do, I don't have one now, but I, uh, I, I have one at home that I forgot to bring. Right. Yes. 
Um, okay, so on the level, that's on the personal level. On the level of policy, you know, it, it's maybe hard to know what to do. These, um, these companies have become very large and even faster than they imagined or envisioned are having you know, impacts that none of them wanted to be associated with from genocides and wars to racial discrimination. Um, what are some steps that you know, governments ought to be taking to you know, regulate with an appropriate heaviness of hand that doesn't kind of arrest innovation and yet also kind of protects us and allows us democracies to be in charge rather than also being managed as societies. Yeah, there, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, there's some interesting proposals that have been coming out and some bills that have been introduced which would do things like um, promoting algorithmic transparency. So if you're going to have an algorithm that's determining what you know millions or billions of people see when they open their news feed or when they scroll through their For You page, like you have to let people see what's in that algorithm, see how it's making the decisions. How is it choosing this video versus that video, this news story versus that story? I think that's a useful thing. Um, I, I think transparency is always better. There's, I th also think there's a role that government can play in kind of slowing down some of these surfaces. So, you know, just making it a slightly bit harder for something to go from zero views to 10 million views. Mm -hmm. Because I think often what happens is the speed is just more than our institutions and our brains can really handle. Um, and so I think there's a useful sort of friction uh, that can be applied. You so mean like, like a stock market, if it drops too fast, it'll arrest trading for a little something bit Something like a circuit breaker, yeah. yeah. So, But, but you know, Twitter, for example, has done these experiments where if you want to retweet something, um, an article, but you haven't read the article, it'll, um, it'll pop up a little thing and you say, are you sure you want to retweet this? You haven't read it. How do they know that? Oh, because of the time that you took to retweet it. Well, or because it just knows that you haven't clicked the link to open the, okay. the news story. Right. And so they found that you know, it has a dramatic impact. People share far less, um, retweet far less news when they are actually asked if they want to read it beforehand. Because you, know, you might see a headline. And they got rid of the feature because and get it, super it wasn't no, they, profitable? They, they, oh, they kept, kept it. Okay. it. It's that's still good. there. Um, and so they found that that's a kind of tweak that they can apply. But I think governments can be looking at those kinds of tweaks too. Um, are there any things that state level you know, local level governments might be able to do? Are there any models of small countries or municipalities that have tried to deal with this behemoths in I ways mean, there that have are been, promising? There have been states and countries that have tried, and certainly, I mean, things like California, where I live, has its own Privacy Act, the CCPA, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's now become sort of the de facto standard for consumer privacy, just like the California auto emissions rules tend to become sort of a de facto national standard. Um, so there are states that have been taking on this stuff. Uh, a couple states have introduced um, bans on facial recognition or certain right. biometric data mm -hmm. collection. So states and, and municipalities certainly can lead the way here, especially when we know that the federal government moves slowly, if it ever moves. Um, I think states have a role to play there. Do, do you have thoughts on whether you know, we should be moving with the big ones, like in a kind of util regulated utility model or just a progressive era, break them up kind of model. What is your, Yeah. is I, there any reason for a company as large as Facebook or Amazon, you think, to exist? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think that it's natural that if, you know, you have uh, a social network like Facebook and everyone you know, you know is on it, it's, it there's, there's value for it being that big, but I, I think the scale, I, I think the scale just is something that we've never seen before in human history, and there may be a reason that we've never seen technologies that have billions of people using them before, because they just become totally ungovernable, mm -hmm. uh, and they become sort of bigger than and nation states. And unknowable. And unknowable, yeah, what is Facebook? What is right. YouTube? You can't even really define these things because they're so big. So I think there is a question about how, how big is too big. I don't know what the answer, I don't know sure. if it's 100 million users or you know, half a billion users or, or 10,000 users, but it certainly seems like things are starting to move in the direction of smaller. Um, there's been a lot of interesting um, sort of analysis and commentary about the rise of sort of group chats 
as a sort of antidote to the noise and the chaos of social media. People really just want to talk with like their eight or ten closest friends. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of this small, I think there's going to be like maybe like there is in food, there's like, you know, you have your industrial fast food and your like local artisanal farm to table thing. And both of those can exist. But um, I think people, especially young people, are starting to migrate toward these smaller channels. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about education some. So at the, you know, in the first iteration of the internet revolution in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was so much conversation about um, making sure that we get, you know, we, we arrest economic, um, educational inequity by getting devices and screens into classrooms, um, that we invest in software that would supposedly personalize learning, um, that we emphasize STEM disciplines and you know, access to coding for all sorts of students. But I was really struck in your book that you suggested, um, you know, the skills our students might need for the future are more the sort of things that you would get as a humanities liberal arts major than an engineering. So, you know, where did that conclusion come from? Yeah, well, this was the first mind-blowing thing that I discovered in the course of researching this book because I, I, I started by going to all the AI experts I could find, all these technologists, computer scientists, uh, economists, historians, you know, CEOs of big companies. And I asked them, like, what are the skills that young people today or anyone need in order to, in order to survive this technological revolution? Um, and I thought they were all going to say, well, they need to learn JavaScript and they need to learn Ruby on Rails and they need to learn, you know, how to program and that's going to keep them safe. And instead they said kind of the opposite. They said, Kids need to learn, and, and adults too, need to learn these kind, of, uh, these kind of timeless human skills, creativity, collaboration, um, empathy, team building, collaboration, leadership, these skills that really aren't attached to a single discipline, but they can be applied across disciplines. Um, and that struck me as, as very strange. It was very unexpected to hear from these all these people who had devoted their careers to technology were all of a sudden saying, wait a minute, we actually think our kids should be learning uh, this other stuff, and and they were not just saying that. They actually, a lot of them enroll their kids in like these super fancy, you know, schools where they don't have any screens and they just play with wooden blocks in the dirt. And it's like they're they're they're, they're sort of putting their, you know, their 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 kids in this very different model of education than the, you know, let's get all the devices into the classroom and let's teach kids how to code and that's what's going to be their sort of ticket to a good stable career. Uh, so that was very interesting, and that's that was what turned that, that light bulb on for me. I thought it was cool that some of the people you interviewed also thought that, um, you know, diversify, diversifying the management and the creative workspace um, could bring into the skill set new ideas that people needed to navigate these new worlds. Like um, one of the people you were telling me about um, thought that, you know, people who had struggled with their gender identity or changed their gender identity suddenly had more insight than the rest of us? Where did, the, where did, these, where did this conversation come from? Well, this was, um, th that particular conversation was um, uh, a talk that I, I attended by a guy named Jed Kolko, who's a, a well-known labor economist. And he's, uh, he's gay, and he was making the point that a lot of these skills, these kind of emotional intelligence skills of kind of reading what other people are thinking and feeling and adapting to, you know, these sort of skills that make people emotionally intelligent are the same skills that you develop as an adolescent who's in the closet or who's undergoing, uh, you know, a, 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 some, some sort of complication with gender identity, who is trying to navigate a world in which you are not the norm. This skill of reading the room, as he put it, um, that's not like a skill that we tend to teach in school, but it's a skill that people who, by virtue of their personal circumstances, have had to do that for part or all of their life, really have to develop. And so his point was that those people actually have a head start when it comes to developing that particular set of skills, uh, those sort of emotionally intelligent skills. To what extent can some of it be taught? Like I know you have this... Um You've talked a little bit about like machi machine age humanities or different kind of interdisciplinary courses. Are there any examples 
at the university level that you think are particularly promising or interesting that you've come across? Yeah, there, there are a number of really interesting examples where basically a school will sort of pair up a humanities professor and a, and a science or, or a STEM professor and have them sort of co-teach a course that's kind of a mixture of two disciplines. Um, so at, at MIT and Harvard, they have like a tech ethics class that's sort of co-taught by technologist and I think it's a philosopher um, and they sort of bridge those two disciplines and that that kind of thing is happening at a lot of schools um, at medical schools now for example a lot of the top schools uh, teach classes that are just about how to communicate with patients they're not about how to diagnose mm -hmm. patients they're not about how to do the latest you know research on protein folding or whatever they're really just about how to communicate how to improve your bedside manner because that skill turns out to be really really important and that is the part of the job that robots are going to struggle to do for a very long time um, whereas some of the more sort of diagnostic work that's the stuff that's being automated other tips for universities, you know, they are, universities are both kind of like fountains of innovation and creativity, but they're also lumbering bureaucracies. Um, where do you think we should be investing or, or looking to change in the, in, the next, in the next few years, or even now, so that we're doing a better job of cultivating those skills that the students really need um, to succeed and, and thrive? Well, one really apparent thing to me is that there's a big hole in the tech labor market around, uh, around ethics and trust and safety and platform and ethical design. So I talk to CEOs all the time and startup founders and investors, and almost all of them say some version of, you know, I wish I had hired more X when I started my company. Uh, Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of Twitter, said uh, in an interview a couple of years ago that he, if he could build Twitter all over again, he wished that he could have hired a behavioral economist and a game theorist because they were staffed with engineers who were good at building engineering things, but they weren't thinking about the implications. They weren't thinking about what happens if people or governments try to use our service to manipulate public opinion. Um, what are the incentive structures that we could create to try to create healthier conversations? So. These, and, and at a number of big tech companies, the fastest growing parts of the company are the trust and safety teams, the people who try to anticipate and, and respond to bad actors abusing the platform, trying to you know, keep Russian bots and <laughs> things from overrunning the platform. So there's a huge growth industry in trust and safety. And so I think if I were a school that was trying to prepare students for the kind of labor market that we're moving into, um, I would focus on those, those sort of human skills, those skills of empathy and creativity and collaboration and leadership. Um, but I would also focus sort of n more narrowly on the kind of humanitarians, the, the sort of the, the humanities side of the tech industry. Because the tech industry is where all the money is. Mm -hmm. So that's where all the jobs are. But at these companies, they have a lot of engineers already. What they don't have are people who can think about the implications of what they're building and how that's going to affect users. Yeah, and they're hiring like little advisory boards and stuff, but they probably need it baked into the personnel all the way through. Absolutely. Because otherwise, if you're just waiting for the decisions to be made at the top, it's a little bit late. Yeah. Um, because of the pandemic, we've just run this kind of massive global experiment in online learning in education. Um, what do you think people are learning from it? My own experience is, is totally junk. And I can't believe anyone would ever homeschool their child voluntarily or send anyone to an online school. I couldn't believe how little anyone could concentrate or learn about anything. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I think, I think as with most things, there are some positives and some negatives. I think, you know, remote work, remote learning, distance learning has been, you know, good for some people, spending more time with their family, you know, people who find it hard to, um, you know, people with disabilities or other people who find it hard to sort of exist in a, in a classroom atmosphere. So there are cases in which I think it can be helpful for people, but for, I think for the vast majority of people, it's, it's pretty clear now that you can't just do school on Zoom and have it be as good as it is in the classroom. Uh, that seems to be like a pretty clear lesson. Where all the research is showing learning loss and um, you know, people are having trouble uh, catching up and even, even some scores of, of emotional intelligence have dropped because you're not like having the kind of in between class social interactions that you would. Um, so I think it's really taught us that there are some things that really can't be done uh, over the internet that, that actually require 
face-to-face uh, -face interaction and that maybe teaching and learning are, are two of those things. Yeah, and it's clear in, we think in schooling and even more at the universities that were conveying content and knowledge, but were also building human beings and fostering relationships and, and we probably don't pay as much attention to that as we should, I'm, I reckon. I mean, this is the classic knock on, you know, uh, on academia is that you, you teach people how to research, but you don't teach people how to teach. And I, I don't think that's true, but that's, there's sort of a, a stereotype that may be rooted in some historical truth there, which is that one of the most important skills a teacher can develop is the teaching part, is not the part where you, you know, submit manuscripts to academic journals and things like that. So I, I think there's going to be a renewed emphasis on, uh, on these human skills, not just in academia, but across the economy. In your book, Future Proof, um, you remain remarkably, admirably optimistic, even in the age of Trump and Putin. Um, so I want to ask you about some of these things that keep you feeling buoyant. Um, one is, uh, tell us about the Clean Tech or the the Clean Tech Awards. Is that what they're called? Good, Good Tech Awards. Good Tech Awards. Yeah, okay. uh, much more generic than that. So yeah, I, every year I, I partially in an attempt to um, cheer myself up near the end of the year, um, I do a column called the Good Tech Awards where I sort of scour the tech world for examples of startups, nonprofits, academic groups who are doing work that I think is just so socially beneficial um, for society. Um, and I try to highlight those people because getting featured in the New York Times can be a pretty cool thing if you're a new startup. Um, it can help you, you know, raise money and do all. Uh, so I, I just I try to shine a little spotlight on uh, companies and groups that I think are doing a good job. Um, so this year, you know, I worked on some, uh, wrote about some um, prison reform um, uh, tech projects. I wrote about. Um, uh, cell-based meat companies, which are doing very cool things with producing uh, meat out of cells in a lab rather than from factory farms. So you can actually grow a steak now or grow a piece of chicken or grow a, a thing of sushi without having to actually raise an animal and kill an animal. Um, and that has all kinds of cool implications for the climate and factory farming and and um, and you know animal rights. And, features. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so um, so those are the kinds of things that I look to spotlight. Cool. Um, you also you know the tech industry has grown so fast and now really has a lot of employees, um, and we're beginning to see some efforts at labor organizing in Amazon and elsewhere. But you found already right that some of the em employee efforts are kind of successfully pushing back at some of the automation that and the efficiencies that Amazon has so ruthlessly demanded? Yeah, I, I find the <coughs> Amazon labor story totally fascinating um, because what you have in Amazon is a company that has taken automation to its logical extreme. I mean, Amazon is a robot company that just happens to sell toilet paper and dog food and uh, you know computer parts and things like that. Their product is efficiency and logistics and they have huge numbers of robots and crucially, they want their people to behave like robots until they can- At all levels. At all levels. Um, until they can actually build the robots to replace them. So in warehouses today, in Amazon warehouses, you have robots and you have people who take directions from robots and who are punished if they take too long at the bathroom or if they miss their packing target. They have, some of them have little you know, wristbands that vibrate and they can automatically be you know, fired if they miss their target too many times in a row. And they really want people to act like robots. That's what you know, workers who are efficient do. Um, but the workers don't like acting like robots, it turns out. If you make someone, you know, uh, if you strip away all of the, human, the humanity parts of their jobs, they don't like that, and so they tend to resist, whether that's organizing a union, whether that's there's uh, reports of some um, you know, drivers and workers um, sort of sabotaging the, the machines uh, that are supposed to be keeping track of them. Um, there are all kinds of interesting ways that, that workers in these conditions are resisting, and that's just, we've seen that since, since the Luddites. Right. Yeah, and the extent to which um, work floors are humane is a product of people fighting for it and demanding it. It doesn't, it doesn't come automatically. Absolutely. Um, broadly looking at the future, we know from the Terminator movies what the worst case scenario is. 
But if we successfully learn to control our own attention and time, um, if we're able through democratic structures to devise effective regulations and regulatory mechanisms, you know, if greater numbers of employees from white collar to blue collar successfully mobilize to defend their rights against these giant companies and so on, like, what do you think the best case future scenario can be as these technologies continue to develop, say, think, 10 or 20 years from now? I think it's a vision of a world in which we work much less and have much more time to do the things that um, bring us joy and meaning and connection. There's a, a funny, uh, not, it's not a funny book, but it has a funny title that came out a few years ago called Fully Automated Luxury Communism. Uh, which is just about sort of a vision of a world in which all the basic necessities of life are provided for us by robots, um, and we just sort of become philosopher kings. We make art, we hang out with our families, we, you know, go for walks, we swim in the ocean, we surf, you know, we live, basically like we, we can all be Hawaiians if we, if we pull this off right. Um, and I think that, um, I think that's possible and doesn't need, I think communism is in the title is sort of a, a red herring. It doesn't need to be a communist system, but it could be a system in which we have a lot more time to do the things that bring us joy and not have to spend, you know, eight, 10, 12, 14 hours a day working to put food on the table. And it's, it's true that Hawaiians and other indigenous people have kind of often argue in their movements for a totally different way of conceiving the way of living and um, you know, using ancestral knowledge to kind of think about the way we've organized the world and ought to organize it differently. That so. makes a lot of sense to me. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. It was lovely having this conversation with you and your, your optimism is infectious in a good way. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanna thank our student staff who are helping us produce this, um, our partners, the Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools and the College of Social Sciences Digital Studio for producing the show. Thank you very much. Aloha. <laughs>